some things you know, to some things you've heard. We want to thank uh, Dr. Nix very much for making us feel that way. Mm -hmm. And now, if you have questions for her, she will be the right person. But let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Questions. This is my part. So I'm a professor, so I love. I will come, you know, engage, please. Welcome. Uh, my question is why do you think the narrative continues with like Booker T even after he passed with him being like deified or like being made the icon? Like, why do you think that continues? And who 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 kept it going? Mm. So that's a great question. Um, so when we look at Washington and we look at kind of this representation of him, we also have to put that in conversation or what my research puts in conversation of social movements. What movements are happening also simultaneously? So when we look at the, we gotta go, gotta go way back. So when we go back to like the 1930s and in the bio of Ralph Ellison, it mentioned um, how he had to leave Tuskegee when the Great Depression hit and things like that. Well, after that period in the 1940s, there was this boom of Washington nationally. So Washington was featured as the first African-American on U.S. commemorative money, the silver half dollar. He was the first African-American featured on the U.S. postage stamp. And if you drive past the Wilcox buildings, you'll see the stamp that's there um, that he was featured on. And this was an intentional movement by some of the family, uh, Washington's family, um, and also the black middle class of the time too, to rebrand images of what is black and what does it mean to be black and American? Because prior to then, there were you know, considered images of the mammy, these characters, caricatures of Uncle Tom, or you know, really uh, being um, kind of accommodating or over accommodating to um, white social politics and white political politics. So, um, but when we get to that civil rights movement, the 1950s and 60s that we often discuss relative to Dr. King and Malcolm X and some of the black arts movement that was in the 1970s, we start to see more kind of a radical upfront activist approach. And Washington was more subdued in how he challenged uh, white supremacy. He, he, you know, um, it's, a, it's a line that I love, uh, Beyonce says, you know, always stay gracious, best revenge is your paper. So if I had to put Washington in modern context, he would say your best revenge is getting that green and that's what he did and we're sitting in a, evidence of it. But um, so, it's, it, so there a lot of kind of social movement of people wanting to be more radical, wanting to be more upfront. And we're currently in Black Lives Matter right now. So there's a lot of visibility and, um, talking about diversity and inclusion, even challenging that. Um, and so we, we have to kind of look at what is the political shifts that are also connected to that. And Washington was a man of his time, you know? He was formerly enslaved. He literally, um, you know, worked on a plantation and other things like that. So, um, so I would say that social movement is really connected to these shifts and how Washington still kind of it's a, it, he's a conflicted figure because while pe some people love him and some people don't necessarily like him. Um, but one thing that I find myself being in my research is a bridge between that. And I kind of emerged that way. I wasn't intentionally planning on it, um, but it happened because I, I'm from Alabama and a lot of scholars who write about Washington have not been here. They have not been on this red Alabama clay that we you know, build on and our buildings are built from. They come in, they go to our amazing archive and then they jet set out. But to walk and to be in the community um, that some people could overlook because they're like, Tuskegee doesn't have anything. Look at, you know, it's not, you know, businesses there and everything like that, but that's where strategy happens. Mm -hmm. And though it might be, you know, small relative to other places, we have to look at the quality that's being produced as well. And that's why the Washington also continues to resurface um, as this figure who we kind of love to hate and hate to love. So I hope that answered your question. Okay.
and young people is being lifted or lowered? Oh, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, well, first, let me let me ask you: Do you feel as though the veil of ignorance is being lifted or lowered? Um, I would say lowered. Mm. Okay. I would say don't be so hard on the young people at this time. Um, we were, uh, some of the faculty were having uh, lunch earlier and talking about social media and talking about, you know, um, how because social media has advanced, um, there's a lot of discussion around its use, um, its value. And though there are some and I, and I bring up social media because this is a part of the this is a part of your generation um, where you have everything kind of instantaneous at your fingers. You can we could literally pull up a video of Paris France right now and see what's going on um, or look at how Black Lives Matter protesters are, you know, protesting in that space. Right. Like social media is this avenue uh, for a generation that really highlights what we are, um, we as a society, as a global society, um, are needing to be, um, are, are needing to kind of fix and heal. So that's power to you all. Um, my, my niece and nephews, their parents in here right now, they can get and create a video real quickly. They're showing me, and I'm, I don't consider myself that old, but I am, you know, a little bit old enough to where the things that are happening that you all do just effortlessly um, using technology, I, I'm a little delayed in that. And so creating videos or doing this and putting word out there is lifting that veil. Um, and where I would say the lowering may happen comes from not exercising that power that you do have. Um, feeling as though the struggles that you encounter right now are only isolated to you. It belongs to a larger trajectory before you. So when we cut out the elders, when we cut out those who have come before us, that's leaving that void and gap, and you might feel like that veil is being lowered. But we have to bridge conversation, we have to bridge the activism um, of the past with the present. And so I would say it's a, it's a two-way street. So it could be lifted in one way and it could be lowered, which is a part of this, this conundrum that we're in and that that statue presents for us. Um, I want to just fantastic talk. And I also want to identify with, because that happens to faculty too, where people put you on the spot and, and they talk about Tuskegee like they know all about it and who Booker T was. And one of the things that I would bring up, and I wonder if you've thought about this too, I'm sure you have, is, the, is his interest in health and the National Negro Health Week and the national business. I mean, people see him in very narrow terms sometimes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like they construct a figure that they can then, you know, attack for, oh, he did this or he put, you know, he wanted to put, lower the veil, you know. And mm -hmm. I think that the whole breadth of what he d does you know, and I'm obviously on the other side. Right. Anyway, I just wanted to, great talk. Oh, thank you, Dr. Gampari. Um, you know, uh, just special moment. So um, with, with Dr. Gampari and Dr. Nkuma, Dr. Fishkin, those who are here in the room, these were my professors. And, you know, just to hear them and to hear their praises and actually trying to hold back tears um, because this, these are literally the hands that have, you know, shaped me. Um, in my journey who have remained in contact throughout the years. Um, and so the experience that you do have, you know, here at Tuskegee, you know that it is personalized. And one, one experience, before I get to that, Dr. Kev Part 2, I do want to address that, but while my heart is, you know, leading in that direction. Um, when I started my first semester of grad school, I mentioned, you know, went to Purdue. Well, that was the first, that was the semester that my mom passed away from cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, first, first, I didn't have family there. I didn't have anyone, didn't know anyone there. Like I said, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. That's my first time away, you know, really that far. And the people in my department at that time, I did not get one thank you, I mean, I did not get one card. I did not get one sympathy note. But what the English department did, they sent 
they sent a card, they sent flowers, they, they acknowledged and recognized. And that let me know that the education that I got here was beyond just the education, it was that personal and relational. And that has existed throughout the years. And so I expressed my gratitude so much, you know, um, in this moment too, because um, it has remained with me. And kind of going back to that question about Washington and really kind of, we have to diversify our understanding around him and what his activisms were too, being, you know, the National Health Week and things like that. And part of the tragedy of his story is that he was at the cusp of making other transitions and changes and he passed away in 1915. And so, um, with that, a lot of his legacy then became out of his hands, um, which is significant too, because there's only so much that we can do in the allotted time that we have here on earth. And so it's important that whatever you craft, it has a solid foundation enough to whom pick, whoever picks it up once you leave, they can at least get the essence of that. And I think the foundation that Tuskegee is still here is a part of the essence of Washington. So even though people want to, you know, put him in that box and talk about him lowering that veil, you know, humble brag, I say, what institution did the boys leave? <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> I love the boys. I love the boys. But when we talk about legacy, we also have to talk about institutional building. And um, there's, there's a lot of ways I even look at Washington and popular culture. I look at him through the lens of Beyonce's work. When I was here in 2020, um, the political science, um, was it the political science and history department mm -hmm, did a symposium and I presented a presentation then that looked at Beyonce's visual work using Washington's image um and lemonade in that that and so um we do we have to diversify that and um i think it's good that we're still talking about them mm. so I'm gonna do a little crowdsourcing because that's a great question. What, but his question was, um, what is a book that I would recommend to you and your generation right now? I wanna ask you like I asked my students. I say, um, what book have you read or are you reading that's influencing you right now? You can do it by show of hands and just call it out, uh-huh. Um, I would say the love song is Yes, write it down. There you go. The love song of WB. That's it. That's on my reading list. That's good. Uh huh. Native Son by Richard Wright. Native Son by Richard Wright. Classic. Uh huh. We creating a reading list. If I had the board here, I'd go ahead and write it down. <laughs> write it down for us. Uh huh. Uh huh. What else? Yes. A Long Walk to Water by Linda Park. Okay. Yes. Uh, the Fire Next Time. The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. Good. All right, uh-huh. Feminism by Lisa Ah, feminism, yes. Hood feminism. Hmm? Hood feminism. Hood feminism, yes, yes. Love it, we're getting to some of our theoretical frameworks and approaches too. So did, did that answer some of your question? Because I approve, I, I approve. <laughs> this message is approved. <laughs> yes. Oh, I have another book. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, the Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. Yes, The Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. All of these texts that I'm hearing, too, um, they speak to, of course, some form or aspect of society, whether it be um, about feminism, um, black women, whether it be about, um, you know, uh, historical criticisms or critiques. Um, that's, what, that's, that's what that list that we just did here in class uh, <laughs> created, okay? Other questions? Other well, questions? I just want to congratulate Mr. Oh, Dr. Sabrina. Yes, yes, Dr. Sabrina. Yes. I want to congratulate you to come back and visit your professors and 
ah, yeah, somebody remembered. I started as a nursing major. When I came here, I was over in Basil O'Connor. Um, so I, like many of you, um, was chasing the dollar um, when I chose a major. And um, at that time, also, I was um, at a very accelerated magnet program, lamp magnet program in Montgomery, and um, doing very well in my AP bio, AP anatomy, physiology. I love my STEM side of me. And um, I'm also a creative. So um, we had a family friend at the time. She was a traveling nurse. And she showed up her paycheck. She made $8,000 in two weeks going to California. <laughs> and I said, I'm gonna be that. Um, and I also, uh, but I also wanted to be a doctor, not a medical doctor. I wanted to be a nurse, but I wanted to be a nurse practitioner. Um, or I wanted to get my PhD in that. So there was that lingering for me somewhere in the background that I wanted doctor, I didn't want MD, but I wanted to discuss like, you know, research. So um, when I got here, um, I had scholarship. Um, and things like that. And I was in Honors English uh, with Dr. Nkuma, and I had already been questioning uh, whether or not what my calling was. Um, so I'd often go sit at the chapel, uh, it's a beautiful place, just go sit at the chapel and kind of reflect and talk to God. I'm a person of faith, so I would talk to God and see, you know, God. And it was really tugging at me that I know that I wanted to help people. I know that I wanted to be with people, but I also loved writing and speaking. And I came, I, my, both my parents were educators um, in the Montgomery public school system. So um, I kind of looked at it as, yeah, teachers don't get paid a whole lot, you know, and seeing my mom go through cancer growing up, I wanted to be, you know, in the medical profession to help people like those who helped my mom. Um, and when I took my honors English and Dr. Nkuma mentioned to me about, um, uh, it was a research program called the undergraduate, the UNCF Mellon Mays Undergraduate Research Fellowship Program. And, but you had to be an English major or humanities uh, major. I wasn't ready to change. I was like, what am I gonna do with English? Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna be a teacher. Um, and my oldest brother, uh, who's passed away now, the late Reverend Dr. Echo Nunes Jr., he was in graduate school getting his PhD in religion and theology. So I had some of that circulating in my story, but um, what ultimately did for me was when I would talk to people and they would say, you have to make that decision for yourself. We can't tell you. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and take a leap and switch my major to English. Um, so, because I really wanted to do that program. And I did, I got Dr. Nkuma, we sat in her office working on my essay. I still have the essay and I pulled it actually uh, for another essay competition. I mean, another uh, fellowship opportunity that I received and got accepted into it. And, um, and I knew it was the right move for me. So I know that's a long way of kind of answering it, <laughs> but I hope that some of it answered, you know, your question. Is anybody questioning your, your major or questioning your career path or trajectory? <laughs> All right, some people. Yeah, yeah. I changed my major in grad school. I, I know, right? I didn't think that was possible. I entered graduate school majoring in English. However, I was introduced to the interdisciplinary field of American studies. And American studies allowed me to merge race, gender, identity, national belonging in conversation and showed me more than just how literature can be applied by reading it and doing essays. I can literally create visual analysis. I can do these other things. And um, so that, that, that was a journey too, that to accept change and to say, you know, I'm gonna make that leap no matter where it takes me. Just kind of follow it. And yes, you do get paid, okay? You get paid. I have been international. I've been different places. So it does pay. <laughs> yes, 
great lecture, oh, by the way. You. That was beautiful. Uh, my name is Kendra. I'm an English student as well. And I wanted to know, how hard was it for you to transition out of Tuskegee into a place that you've never been before? And then also, did you feel, um, was that what kind of set off your sense of pride to grow being a product of Tuskegee? Mm. Yes, I think it kind of answering, answering your own question. Um, so, um, how was that transition? Um, well, the first thing that's coming to mind is it was cold, literally. <laughs> any Indiana, any Hoosiers in here? All right, all right. Which areas? Lake County. Okay, all right. Indianapolis. All right, Naptown. Um, I'm a member of the Indianapolis and Cincinnati Tuskegee alumni chapters. So it was cold at first, uh, so much so when I first moved up there, some people in the apartment were laughing at me because I didn't even have the right coat um, lined to handle the snow and the other things like that. Um, but um, also what it, because I went from being here, what's our population, about 5,000, um, 3,000, about 10,000? Oh, you got campus, well. 3,000. Okay, about 3,000 campus wide into a campus that was 45,000 people. And talk about being a number. I literally felt like a number. Um, professors, it was, um, they were focused on research. I was at a research one institution, so professors are focused on research. They're not focused on, you know, that connectivity or the, the things like that. Um, so what I found community in was actually the program that, there was a program that Dr. Fishkin, Ben Fishkin, uh, here referenced before, which was the Historically Black Visitation Program then to go visit Purdue uh, when I was a senior and to look at graduate school. So, um, so other people who were part of that program who came from HBCUs, we could develop community, the Black Graduate Student Association. So I kind of found community there. Um, and I learned to adjust my expectations of what were from my faculty. Um, and I realized that mentorship looks different. Um, and that's, you know, and you have to navigate what that mentorship looks like um, from, from faculty. So in an academic, in an academic space, I was good, you know, Tuskegee and my prior experience prepared me. I literally in my office right now have books from um, the professor's classes that I took here uh, that, that care, they get heavy, but I do carry them with me from place to place. And um, so my foundation educationally, that wasn't the thing. It was really more about that kind of social adjustment, um, adjusting the expectations of performing at that R1, you know, kind of standard, their brand. Um, and what was the second, was the second part of your question? Um, did your sense, well, how did oh. your sense of pride grow being at a place that wasn't Tuskegee? Well, I definitely had to defend it, so I was very prideful of it. <laughs> um, I was, I, I, I did. Um, I was proud of it. I was the, only, the first Tuskegee that the first Tuskegee alum that that the English department graduate director had. So I was kind of trailblazing in a sense too in that space. Um, but it, I, I'll admit it was a journey because I questioned my southerness, um, being in the Midwest, uh, meaning. The deep south down here it's, it's an interesting space and how we have to navigate racial tensions and racial relations is interesting to say the least um and so i i went on my own journey of what does it mean to be southern not living here anymore um you know and to be more cultured and and things like that um and to recognize then take that and say the south is cultured the South is diverse. The South, you know, uh, the South got something to say. So it, it did. I had to, but I had to give myself to that journey because sometimes it can be scary doing that own reflection when you leave here. You all, are I mean, you all are doing it. You know, y'all are. It's, it's many people who would love to have the privilege of what you are doing right now, just sitting in a seat, getting higher education. So we should not take that for granted. There are people still um, in their 70s and 80s who cannot read who do not know the words that are before them, right? People who are your age, who cannot read, who are getting by, by you know, other methods and modes. So um, we all are kind of going through a journey, so I would say it just continues.
history organization is good for an English presentation? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. So, um, and ASALA, again, is the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which was founded um, by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, um, who is, does anybody know Dr. Carter G. Woodson? What, he's not behind? Um, the Association for the Uh-huh, that's, that's his book, that's right, that's right, his book. And also as the founder of National Negro History Week, which then became Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And so um, that organization has continued well over, um, I think it's a 100 plus year uh, uh, celebration now. And why is it important that as English um, and even humanities that we kind of intersect history? Well, because we're not excluded from it. We're not writing or writers are not writing in a vacuum. They're writing about what's happening socially, what's happening politically, what's happening personally. And all of that's connected to, you know, what's going on, um, you know, in the world. So whether or not they're doing that in a creative form through poetry or through play um, or other, you know, avenues, I think it's critical that we have English and history be in conversation with each other, which my work kind of segues into that too. It just happened that way. Um, by, by looking at Washington. I didn't set out to say I was going to look at Washington um, and looking at him through literature and the works of Zorno Hurston and um, you know, others, Langston Hughes and Al Ellison. Uh, I was, I proposed, I think, doing something on Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, because I was from Montgomery. And um, so the, the project kind of found me, but the history piece and I'm and very closely connected with historians. So my best friends are historians. Um, and we often go into this conversation and the literature part really illuminates that conversation because it shows that we can talk about history, we can talk about politics um, in a way that uh, may be visual, in a way that may be sonic through song, through you know, sight and other things, through taste, through culinary art. Um, all of this is expression of history and culture and things like that. So it's important that we have them be in conversation, which is, you know, what I learned about the value of interdisciplinary work, crossing disciplines. We have to be in conversation with y'all. STEM folk, my, my nursing folk, hadn't forgot about y'all, right? Because uh, as Dr. Uh, Gephardt mentioned earlier, Washington was involved in a, nat in a national Negro, um, in a national um, health a uh, week and initiative, right? So health is also connected. We just left a pandemic, right? We're still wearing masks. That invites conversation of who's chronicling this story that people are going to be reading. You're living a story right now. I hope we know that, right? You're gonna be standing up here and people are going to be asking you questions about how did you make it through? What did you do to self-soothe? What did you do to cope? What did you do to heal, right? So all of this is connected to us as, um, as students and then as professionals in the world. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. Oh, I want to know what were some of your discoveries in the research that made you step back and revise, revise how you perceived Washington? Like, you notice how you said in the beginning you perceived him more as a figure? And then as we do research more, you step back and look at him as a human as well. So what made you? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so I'm taken back to my apartment, one bedroom apartment in West Lafayette, Indiana. I'm in my master's program. And I'm sitting on the floor because I have a paper to write. I'm taking a Mark Twain seminar. I think I was the only black in that class. That wasn't not the case in most of my English classes. I'm looking through archives because I wanted to deal with something black um, in the novels and works of Mark Twain. So I'm going through some of the digital archives and I came across this play that was written by Langston Hughes called Booker T. Washington in Atlanta. And I was amazed because here was this Harlem Renaissance writer, Langston Hughes is known 
you know, for, for a lot of works. The Negro Speaks of Rivers, um, Mother to Son, you know, a lot of stuff. And here was Booker T. Washington. I'm like, how is he writing about Booker T? Like, they weren't even the same period. Like, what's going on here? You have no history. And so um, I went to search. Couldn't find anything on it. I couldn't find, I was like, wait a minute. Like, nobody has talked about this? Like, I, this is un unheard of. And how, what's going on with this play? He outlined Booker T. getting prepared to give this the ex exposition address in Atlanta, get it on the train, and some of the conversation, fictionalized, of course, conversation he could have had with his wife and with his children and you know seeing him as a as the principal here at the time um having to deal with matters of tuskegee and and uh, the people in the community saying hey booker you about to go give a, a important speech and so that play kind of it looked it looked at him as as a person who was engaging with the local community outside of what we now have as gates and it had him with his wife and it had him with his kids and they weren't calling him, you know, principal or president. They were calling him Papa. So in that way, um, as I started to uncover more, I found that, and this was, this was kind of got my, my bulbs going when I found it, was that play was connected to Langston Hughes um, being commissioned by CBS Radio. Um, we have CBS Television, but it started as radio before we had television. Um, for a commemoration for Washington being featured as the first African American on a U.S. postage stamp in 1940, and there was huge celebration in Philadelphia. I mean, this was a national thing. Like when we talk about Obama when he became president, this was before that. Like Washington literally was a pre a precursor to the first official Black president that we had. He was that Black president for Black America. Even so much so, if you look at the WPA slave narratives, it asks. Uh, about his significance in that way. So when I, I looked at that, and that's when I had to know more, I had to go back to Margaret Murray Washington. I had to go back to Olivia Davidson. I had to go back uh, to, um, to Fanny, I think Fanny, his first wife. I had to go look at his children um, and to see him on the farms and other things like that. And to really get a picture in a sense, go back and read his primary words through that lens of him, not critically, but chronicling. Chronicling what he encountered while he was moving about this rural community. Um, we can probably still see some of the houses that I believe were here when Booker T was here. Um, they grown up with weeds, but I believe we probably can still trace it. If I were here, I'd do a, a, a visual, a, a movement project for us on that. But, you know, I think that that's what, what kind of inspired me to look at him more as the man and kind of understand, like, hey, he was a man, so of course he was gonna make some decisions that didn't make people happy. I mean, we do that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And when I put that in, in, in context of people, then that shifts that narrative of not just singling Washington as limited to Tuskegee. Um, so that moves him uh, away from that narrative as well. That's a great question. Thank you, you took me back. <laughs> So, like, during your research on, like, did you ever find anything that you kind of, like, disagreed with that he did for the school? Like, you would have done that the same way he did, or, like, just another way of doing things? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> um, that's, that's the part about researching a human subject, right, who's historical. You can't have a conversation with them. Um, you have their letters, you have the responses that people gave, you have some of the, the context that happened. Um, I find that, that I sit at that tension because I'm also a millennial scholar, right? I'm also somebody who's not living during that time period. Um, as Ellison mentioned, or in the, the protagonist mentioned Invisible Man, when talking about the statue, um, and the, the, the eyes looking out to a world they had never known. Um, I don't know what it was like for him being a slave on a slave plantation or a slave plantation um, you know, in Malden, West Virginia, um, or in uh, Hillsborough, Virginia. Um, and what he had to learn strategy-wise to, to, to survive. Um, in, that work, in the work that I do, I put him in conversation with Frederick Douglass, as we should. 
because Frederick Douglass was his precursor. And actually, Frederick Douglass um, lended over, we shall say, his network to Booker T, a young somebody from Hampton, Virginia, uh, to come lead an initiative here in Tuskegee where it was just a little, little shanty, a little shack before we you know, get to campus. And so Douglas then, um, you know, really is, it, you know, he is his own separate figure. There's a, a documentary on HBO Max um, that looks at uh, Frederick Douglass, called The Five Speeches of Frederick Douglass. I encourage you to check it out. I just watched it last week. Um, it really gives you a good picture of Douglas. So um, Washington carries on that legacy. So the things that I questioned about Washington and decisions building Tuskegee or doing, you know, some of the other work that he was doing, um, some of it I had to tear through with uh, gender politics and his stance with women, particularly black women, black women's aesthetic, um, hair, uh, having how black women, you know, should have their hair and things like that. That comes up when we talk about Madam C.J. Walker. So my Indiana people, y'all should know something about in, uh, Madam C.J. Walker, right? Mm -hmm. She moved her business there to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And Indianapolis was a hub for this movement of Harlem Renaissance people. Uh, they were like people, you know, jazz musicians and other things like that. So they were moving and migrating from Harlem, New York, to Chicago, and Indianapolis was one of the stops. So Madam C.J. Walker, she moved her business there, and the documentary, or it's a kind of a, a fictionalized documentary on Madam C.J. Walker on Netflix. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker, um, check it out, I think it's called Self Made. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Washington comes up in that. And um, so how he dealt with or did not deal with the women um, of that period was something that I often got a lot of kickback from when I was going through grad school because they said, well, here's Madam C.J. Walker talk, you know, talking about him, or Ida B. Wells, who was talking about uh, lynching um, and things like that. Well, what, do, what is your stance on that? Um, and that's when I had to kind of go back and sit in the shoes of, okay, what would Booker, Booker had, like, he wasn't opposed to women. I mean, he was married, you know, and you go back and look at some of the letters too. Uh, Margaret Murray, we love her, but uh, she knew what she wanted, and um, she wanted Booker. So Booker was a widow. He was a widower, right? His his both his his wives had passed away, and so he was a single father, uh, trying to build an institution. Um, and you know, uh, so some of that may have been, and also, I just look at the different social movements at the time that influenced my own frustrations of why I feel frustrated um, with that. Or um, there's some letters between George Washington Carver, our famed scientist and Booker sure. T. Carver was asking for more cattle. He was asking for more lab equipment and things. And Booker said, I just gave you some. What more do you need? <laughs> and so that was him as administrator, right? Mm -hmm. That was him as an administrator having to you know, uh, deal with doing ph ph um, uh, philanthropic campaigns and other things and still having to <coughs> administer the students and the faculty and community here. So um, when trying to look at it outside of my perspective, that's what it kind of helps me. Does that answer? Yes. Good, good. Y'all must be really engaged. I'm getting questions and things. I got me up here. I feel good. All right. Oh, yes. Uh, I just have to say thank you for your speech. I did appreciate that. Um, my name is Azaria. I'm from Indiana as well. And my question is that, like, I know Booker T is like, very about indulging the resources that we already have beneath us to like, support one another. I wanted to know, like, how do you believe, as individuals, how do we cast that on our own buckets to support? You know, each other and promote our communities. Mm. Oh, that's a great one. How do we cast down our buckets where we are taken from the Atlanta Exposition Address? Um, you know, that question is, I mean, it's, it's, it's oh, it stumps me, right? Because there's so many different avenues. And I would say to first start with what you are doing the things that you, you know, do find that you um, 
are interested in. Um, are there any social, you know, projects or art projects or, you know, things like that, creative work that you want to do? Um, assess, do, it starts with self. First assess um, where you would like that bucket to be cast. Um, where have you already casted buckets? And then look at, you know, some of the, I think some of the issues that we have as a society too is we don't know where all we can get information from or resources or things like that. Um, sometimes that involves going outside of your comfort zone, social, socializing with different groups, um, finding activities that may be out of your typical norm um, to get involved in and to see how do other people do and move and think. Um, and then that kind of shapes your, shapes your, your thinking too. Um, I know that's not as tangible of an answer. Uh, it's still conceptual. Um, are there, yeah, yeah, I know it's not as tangible, but it is conceptual. And I think it does start with the concept of wanting to cast your bucket or wanting to get involved um, because that requires a mental shift. Um, and it also requires that you're going to go on a journey and um, you might not get it right as to, you might join something or a cause and be like, oh, I don't wanna do this. You know, I, I, I see more about this. And that's okay. Um, this is the time, especially as college students, to explore um, and to get involved with things. And as you just give it time, too, give it time, because life is going to present you enough opportunity um, to get involved in something. Whether or not you want it, it will. Thank uh, Dr. Nix very much for taking the time to answer all the questions that uh, you asked. I want to thank her for making this lecture so practical so that we can all engage with it and ask these questions. We wish her all the best. Thank you once again for coming to Alma Mater to deliver this lecture for us. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Without you here, it wouldn't be the same. <laughs> She'll be talking to her in the space. <laughs> but you all showed up. So yeah, give yourself a hand. Thank you. <laughs> I cannot finish something without saying thanks to Dr. Zani Spong, who is not here, it's under the weather, but she did most of the legwork for Dr. Nick Stella during this year. And so we wish her all the best. I want to say thank you to her for all that she did to make this possible. And I cannot also finish without thanking the Office of the President. They were just fantastic with sponsoring this and providing the funds we need for this particular lecture. I want to thank Dr. Barr and the Beijing um, Trustee University Coaching uh, voice, Voices for being here. Always when we invite them, they come, and so we are very thankful. For our students, our English majors, Julie and uh, Cece, who participated and taught us this, we say thank you very much. We are so grateful to everybody. <coughs> I just say sit back and thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Selfie, with our real quick. Thank you, Dr. Selfie, just remembering the moment when we get just a real quick selfie. <laughs> Hope we get all of that. Okay. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you.